Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn. This is my YouTube channel for everything I want to talk about science and math. And today we are continuing with Unit 3 for Chemistry, which is going, covers radiation and quantum chemistry. So yesterday, in, in Part 1, we talked about radiation and nuclear chemistry. For Part 2, we're going to talk now, we'll move out to the electrons, and talk about quantum chemistry. That sounds smart, doesn't it? You're going to be very smart learning this. You smart kids, um, you learn the same things over and over again, and it gets boring. So the great thing is, is you probably don't know this. I'd be very shocked if anybody besides me knows about what you're about to learn. Yay! Okay, so, in... And, and, okay, so let me tell you why the notes are like they are. Um, last year, I had done the notes that are the second group of notes in the fall. The, in the spring, when my classes did the element reports, um, I allowed students to do not just the poster board, but they did PowerPoints, videos, all kinds of stuff for, that they sent to me through Canvas. But yet, I still got a virus from one of them. It wiped out everything on my computer. Well, what it started doing is just randomly deleting stuff, and then it would also insert the student's name just wherever, so it would just be a Word doc document and things would go away, and instead his name would start showing up. So um, that was the virus. So that's why we decided to go back to the 80s, the 90s, and y'all did your reports just on a piece of poster board. We can't get a virus from that. But because of that, these original notes had been deleted, the ones from the fall. And so I had to kind of quickly put stuff together for the spring, and I sort of left some stuff out. I'd gone deeper in the fall, and then when I was finally able to recover those, they had to wipe everything off my computer. But eventually, I found a copy of them, and I thought, oh, some of that was better. So I gave you guys both sets of notes. If I'd had more time, I would have put them together into one nice set of notes for honors, but instead I just gave them both to you, so there are things that are going to repeat. So what, uh, so what we've been going through are the spring notes that aren't quite as deep. Once we get through going through them, then I'm going to just teach you part of the things and the uh, fall notes, and then the rest, you can, you, we'll, we'll sort of fill it in together with y'all coming up with the answers. So we'll sort of use it as a review, too, and not just, and that's why there's five pages of it. Normally, you wouldn't have that long notes. Okay, so what we learned first is, so we learned about the nucleus, about how it can fall apart, how it can be unstable and give off radiation. We learned how to balance nuclear equations. Now we're going to move out to the electrons. And the electrons, we already know from our Bohr models that they hang out in clouds, that they can be in orbitals, and that when they get energized from our video, they can jump up into higher orbitals, and then they can jump down again, giving off part of that energy as light. Everybody's with me so far? Now the new concept is this idea of the address of the electrons. Every electron in an atom hangs out in a different place and we can know its address. And that seems kind of crazy until you think about you. You're one person in a world of billions I've heard everywhere from seven to nine billion, which two billion is a lot, is a big plus or minus. So it depends, sort of, it seems like on the political agenda how many people are in the world. But we could be safe to say that there are billions and billions of people, right? But if I, I could get something to you, if I address it to you, First of all, I would address it to the United States, and that would get rid of all the people in all the rest of the countries. I would address it to Georgia, and that would get rid of all the people in the rest of the states. I would address it to, we'll say you live in Dallas, I would address, address it to Dallas, and that would get rid of everybody in every other city in Georgia. I would address it to your street, and that would get rid of everybody on every other street. I would address it to your house, and that would get rid of every other family in the whole world. And then I would put your name on it, and it would go to you out of all the people in the world. Does that make sense? So you have an address that tells where you are out of all the billions of people. 
well, there aren't millions of electrons and we can give each one an address. And how we do it, it's not as big as your address. It's just four numbers and they're called, dun -dun -dun -dun, the quantum numbers. There's four of them, okay? Now this is one area that, of differentiation, which means that y'all get to, for the same low, low price of free public education, y'all get extra learning than non-honors. So this is something I go into more deeply with honors, but you will go into it in, in college too. I tutor college chemistry too, so I know where the college kids get hung up why they're failing and this is one of the areas the college kids have a hard time with and uh so uh, i always want to make sure that i give you that foundation so that when you're in college you don't have to hire a tutor that you'll be able you'll, you can be the tutor i've had a lot of students do that that once they're in college they understand chemistry so well that the other kids will pay them to tutor i had one girl and she was at Kennesaw. And um, for the nursing program at that time, they made all the nursing majors take chemistry for majors. So it was a real, so it was the same chemistry that chemistry majors took. And the reason why is they would have more people want to be nurses than they had slots in the program. So they would try to make at least half of them fail this class and pick another major. So they used it as what's called a weed out class. So one of my students, she had her chemistry notebook from me and she was making an A while everybody else was failing. So the other kids came to her and asked her to start teaching them chemistry because the teacher on purpose was not doing a good job. The teacher might be a good teacher, but the teacher was given the task of making sure half the kids fail. So is that a little shocking to you? That that's how college works? That's how college works. So, it, so she started having classes and the kids would pay her $20 a time to come. And she used her notebook and she just taught through all my notes and explained it all to them, which helped her review it. And uh, she made big bucks by being a chemistry tutor while she was still taking it using her chemistry notebook. So hang on to your chemistry. You might can make some money with it. All right, so here's the, how the address works. It's four numbers. The first one is called the qu principal quantum number, but, but because this is science, it's a little bit confusing. You would not expect quantum physics or quantum chemistry to not be confusing, would you? We expect this to be a little confusing, right? If it was easy, then it wouldn't sound hard. Are you with me, Drew and Elise? I'm seeing tops of heads. <laughs> you can do it, Drew. You can pay attention. All right. So the first one is called, it's got three names. It's called the first one. It's called the principal quantum number. It is also designated by the letter, it makes no sense, well, maybe a little bit of sense, lowercase n. It's N. It's the N quantum number. So uh, I guess N for number. Now, why is this confusing? Because lowercase N is already neutron, right? It's confusing. So it could be called the first quantum number. It could be called, and we're going to play a game that's going to make all this make sense. You, you know, we're going to race. We're going to play a game where we race with this. Okay, but it's called the first quantum number. It's also the letter designated by the letter N, and it is called the principal quantum number, and it's which level they live on. So if you look over here at our Bohr model, you can see this is the first quantum number. So for this electron, its first quantum number is one. For that electron, its first quantum number is one. For this electron, what's its first quantum number? Y'all are brilliant, two. So, you, so, so, so good so far, right? We're understanding it so far. Okay, the second quantum number, tells the shape of its apartment. Now, on our Bohr model, it looks like they're all just circles, balls. They're not. They come in different shapes. So the next second one is the shape of the or or orbital. So it's called the second one. It doesn't have a name, a fancy name like principal, but it does have a letter, and its letter is, by tradition, written in cursive, a lowercase l. <laughs> See, that's why you learned cursive in third grade. Did y'all learn third cursive or are y'all part of the generation that didn't learn cursive? <laughs> my kids didn't really learn cursive. Uh, they were part of, the, my kids are just a couple of few years older than you and they didn't learn cursive. And so it's like a secret language. I write something in cursive and especially my oldest, he can't read cursive at all. 
the youngest taught himself cursive, and he knows it. But I don't know if the middle one knows cursive or not. The oldest one does not. The youngest one does. All right. So these are the L quantum numbers. There are, um, so for the first one, the levels they can live on go one to seven. One to seven. So now I'm going to pull down my periodic table. You will notice on the periodic table how many lines there are on the periodic table. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Da -da -da -da. Is it all coming together? <laughs> okay, so here's the next one is that they can live in different shapes of clouds. Doesn't that sound nice? Okay, and these are the L's, and there are uh, four different ones, and uh, they are designated by the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, how do we feel about that? Okay, so there's four shapes. Those shapes are designated by the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3. These shapes also are given a letter because we have to be confusing. We can't just call them the number, but no, we can call them the letter. And more that often than calling them the number, you call them the letter. So the first, the, the first shape is called S, and it looks like, this one's the easy one, it looks like a sphere. So S for sphere, that one actually makes sense. Okay, S for sphere. And how many types are there? Well, there's only one way to make a sphere, right? Y'all have had geometry. There's only one shape that is sphere. So there is only one type of sphere-shaped orbital cloud that the electron can live in. Now, my son, Nathan, also teaches chemistry. And so his little way to remember this, I say S is sphere. But he says also that, what is the sign language for S? Yes, do it. What is it? I think that one's A. What is it, Samantha? That's S. Okay, so if you do sign language A, your fist, I mean S, it looks like a sphere. Okay, everybody got that one? So S, sign language, is sphere. Okay, and it looks like a circle. The next one, quantum number one, is P. And it, the chemistry textbooks say it looks like a dumbbell, but I have never seen a dumbbell that looks like this. It looks like a balloon. Let's see if I can draw it. A balloon twisted in half. You ever take a little balloon and twisted it so it's two balloons? That's what S, that's what P looks like, okay? Now, of the P, it has three orientations, okay? So let's think about math class again. There's X, there's Y, and there's Z. Y'all know the three parts of the coordinate plane? Once it's two, so, so oh, it's crazy once you get to algebra two because they, they're dumb the way they do it. They need to make me queen of math and science and I will fix this. But we're gonna just pretend like they do it the logical way. So you know, Y is up, X is sideways, and we can imagine Z coming straight out at us, right? 3D. How they do it in um, Algebra 2 is they make Y go down, X come at you, and Z go up. Once again, I need to be put in charge to fix that. Okay, so this one is on the Y axis. So we can also draw it on the X axis and I don't know how to draw it on your Z axis, but so we'll just draw one sideways to represent Z. It's coming out at us. So there are three types of P orbitals, which have the letter one, the number one in its address. Y'all are doing good so far. No one's crying and no one has a rash. Good job. Yay. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've taught math and children cry. <laughs> Big old tears just coming down their face. All right, so let me show you. Well, no, I'm not gonna show you that yet. <laughs> I don't wanna overwhelm you. Okay, the next, okay, so P, P, how can you do it like that? So he does sign language, he says P, see it looks like a P? 
but he's got three fingers coming down. So you can remember that there are three P's. Do y'all understand his method? I don't remember how he does. I don't know. I'll have to ask him again, because I think I'm going to confuse his way of teaching it with sign language. Okay, the next one is D's. Okay, and so the number two stands for D. And D's look like fat plus signs. You, can you see it? It's like a plus sign, but it's all fat. I, and there are five of them. How they work, and we're, I'm going to have them drawn better further in the notes. So it can be on the X and Y. It can be in between, like an X, in between X and Y. It can be uh, turned like it's like this, and this like this, and then you can turn it like this and like that. So let me do it for the camera. Okay, I'm going to do it with the, with the sticks. That'll be better. Okay, so the Ds can be like this on the X and Y, or you can turn it on the X and Y, or you can turn it on the Y and Z, or you can turn it between the Y and Z. Okay? <laughs> It'll get better, I promise. Oh, and there's way more to it than that. Okay. So we can draw, so we're going to draw another little fat plus sign and another fat X. Now, that's only four, and there's a fifth one. There's one that looks like two baby pacifiers stuck together. It's, it's got one up top, one down bottom, and a circle around the middle. So that's what the five Ds look like. It's like if you take a balloon and twist it. So it's got a fat part at the bottom and a fat part at the, at the top and the bottom. And then you put a donut around it. That's what it looks like. Okay? Yes, Bryson? They are bigger in your nose. So we're about to see them bigger. Just wait. It will be. I, I drew them big later on. Okay. And that's why the other notes were better and why I included them. So the last one are the Fs. They're designated by number three, and they you can remember S because they're fuzzy. So just draw little fuzzy blobs. They're different fuzzies, but we don't have to know about those. Not until you're a chem major. You can learn more about the fuzzies. All right, so that's our little summing it up chart, but we're going to go back over it again some more, and it'll be bigger later in your notes. So, don't worry about too much now. Let's move on. Moving right along. All right, so here are good pictures. S, there's the sphere. P, see how it looks like a balloon twisted in half. D, fat plus. F, so many little bloops, it looks fuzzy. Do we feel better about it with that picture? Okay, so... Let's go on with the other part of this notes, what the third number is. Get my little page here. Okay, the letter that represents the third one, the third quantum number, because we've done the first and the second, the third quantum number's letter is M sub cursive L. It's M with a subscript Curse of L. And this one tells us which one of those it is. So like, is it the P that's like this, this, or that? Is it the D that's like this, 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 or that? So that's what that third number tells you is which of those orientations the cloud is. Can we imagine that now? Cloud orientation? Yes? All right. And the fourth one, once the electron is in its cloud, it spins. And it either spins clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, in physics, you see you use CW for clockwise and CCW for counterclockwise. So, but with this, 
our designation is going to be plus or minus a half. I'll explain it to you in a second. But this one's letter that represent it, represents it is M subscript S for spin. Now, isn't it fun? You've just learned something you had never learned before, and you're going to get better at it. Uh, one thing I want to teach y'all. Okay, so this is part of being gifted and honors learners. Is you need to learn. One of my jobs is to teach you how to learn. And one of the things as problem solvers, you are the people who are going to solve the world's problems as you get older. You'll be the ones dealing with whatever's going on. The, when you're grown up, you'll be dealing with the wars and the the distribution or whatever's happening once you get grown, you people who are your honors gifted students, you are the, gonna be the leaders. You're gonna be the problem solvers. And one of the things y'all need to start in doing is enjoying the process of solving problems, enjoying being confused. Being confused is part of the process of solving a problem. And if you always know everything and you're never confused, you're not reaching your potential. You're not learning and growing and wrestling with the concept till you master it. So I want y'all to start enjoying that process of solving a problem, of not understanding it to start with, of being a little confused, and then feeling that victory when you understand it and you conquer it. It's a game that you can win, and you can win it by making a lot of money when you grow up or having a job you're very satisfied with, like me. I don't have a lot of money, but I love my job. It's a lot of fun. They pay me to do something fun every day. All right, so there are some rules about writing. There's two things we're going to do. We're going to learn how to write the, the four numbers, the address of every electron quantum numbers. There is a new idea, another idea, another brand new thing, best day ever, called electron configurations. And what you do for that is for each atom, not each electron, each atom, you tell where the electrons are in the orbital for that atom. You got it in your head? Quantum numbers tell the address of an electron. Electron configurations tell where all the electrons are in a particular atom, okay? Um, so there's a song, so I'm missing you the song. This is how it goes. We'll sing it more when you know it. It goes 1s2 and 2s2 and then comes 2p6. Electron configurations, yes, they're really slick. See, it's more fun if you sing. You don't have to sing and dance to do math, but you're not having enough fun if you're not singing and dancing. We'll, we'll review the song later so y'all can get good at it. Okay, so there are rules for making the electron configurations for the periodic tables of the elements. So these are the rules. Oh, and when we do this, if you can beat me, when we race doing this, I'll buy you a candy bar. Or if you're like really into health, I'll buy you like a protein bar. Okay, um, in my decades of teaching, we're not gonna talk about how many, I think I've had to buy two candy bars. So the chances of you beating me is slim to none. But I have bought, they were Snickers bars before, but now I can't just buy you a Snicker bar because a lot of you are allergic to peanuts and it would kill you. All right, can't kill the kids. Sacrifices. What? Sacrifices. Sacrifices. All right, you must follow the rules. Here are the rules. The first one, and you gotta know the names of the rules. The first rule is Hun's rule. Hun's rule. And it says in orbitals of equal energy, they each get an electron before doubling up. Now, let me say this in regular English so you can understand it. If you buy a house, you're all grown up, married, and you're gonna have, start having some kids, okay? You buy a three bedroom house. You and your spouse get the first bedroom. You have a kid, they get a bedroom. You have another kid, they get a bedroom. But th so they each get their own room until you have that third kid, and then we're gonna start doubling up. The kid, is, or, so two kids are going to start sharing a room, right? Then you have another kid, whoop, he's going to share a room too. They each get their own room until the rooms are full, and then they start doubling up. That's Hun's rule. You can imagine that. Hun, he's got some kids. Okay, the next rule is called Pauli's Exclusion Principle. P-A-U-L-I apostrophe S. 
Pauli's exclusion principle. If they share an orbital, if they share a room, one spins clockwise and the other one will spin clockwise, cl counterclockwise. So if two electrons are sharing the same orbital, one will spin clockwise and the other one will spin counterclockwise. How we show that is by arrows. When we do our electron configuration diagrams, you'll draw one arrow up and then one arrow down. That is the symbolism that one is spinning clockwise and one is spinning counterclockwise. In the quantum numbers, you say you designate it by either being plus a half or minus a half. So there's two different ways to do it, either by arrows or by halves, which is used in the quantum numbers. Okay. The next rule is the lowest energy levels fill up first. And that makes sense. This is like an apartment building with no stairs. Remember, they have to quantum leap between the levels. So if you had an apartment building with no stairs and you had to leap between levels, wouldn't it make sense that the lower levels would fill up first? No leaping required, right? Okay, I guess it'd be the same for apartment buildings with stairs. If you didn't have to have stairs, you don't. Okay, and that is called the off-ball principle. A-U-F-B-A-U, the off-ball principle. Is that in your notes? No, write it down. I, I left the name off of it, and I went back and added it. So, when it, the lowest energy lift filling first is A-U-F-B-A-U, off-ball principle. Okay, now, think about an apartment building. And you've got nice big rooms, and you've got little cramped rooms. And you have to jump between floors, because you're an electron, and you have to quantum leap. That just because... Um, a, a, a room is at a lower level, if it's little and not very nice, you might make the effort to go up a level for a nice big room. Can you imagine that if you were an electron? That's what really happens. So how these rooms fill on the periodic table is not just all the ones on the first floor fill first, all the ones on the second floor fill second, all the ones on the third floor fill third. Instead, it goes by energy. What controls it is the energy level. So I'm gonna take this up and explain it to you. Can I roll all, all the way? Okay, so this little thing will show you the order they fill in. So this is one way, when I was in high school, I did it this way, and I, um, because you, you could write this on your paper. You number one, two, three, four, five, six, S, go over one, two, three, four, five, six, P, go over one, D, three, four, five, six, go over one, F, four, five, six, then draw diagonal lines, and it shows you the order they fill in. 1S fills first, the, the first four sphere shape room. 2S fills second. 2P fills third. 3S fills next. Then 3P, 4S fills before 3D. That nice big sphere shaped room on the fourth floor is more attractive than that cramped little third floor D room. Does that make sense to you? Now, I don't like this way anymore. I will, I'm going to teach you how to use the periodic table instead. Because what I've seen after doing this for years is kids will get off. They'll get off with their lines and get it wrong. With the periodic table, you won't get it wrong. So I'll teach you how to do that. Okay, there's another thing. Once we learn to write these electron configurations, they're very, the ones for the big atoms are very, very long. So there's a shortcut way to do it called the noble gas configuration. And I'm going to teach you that too, but you can't just use noble gas. You have to know how to do both for the test. So this is sort of like a preview. All right, so now we're going to do an example problem. Okay, so uh, hydrogen. We look on the periodic table, and how many electrons does hydrogen have? One. So which room will it go into? 
The first one, it'll be on the first level, one, and it's going to be a sphere-shaped room, and it's going to have one electron in it. That's how you write it, 1s1. Okay, now we're going to do helium. How many electrons does helium have? Two. So where are they going to go? They're going to go on the, the first floor, the nice big S room, and they're going to go ahead and now they're going to share a room, one electron spinning clockwise, one spinning counterclockwise, and so the electron configuration for helium is 1s2. All right, feeling good so far? New skill? You're doing good. I see a few little worried looks, but, but everybody seems to be hanging in there so far. Let's try some more of these. Okay, we're gonna try lithium. How many electrons does lithium have? Three. Three. So where are the first two gonna go? One S. One S, and there'll be two in there. And then the, the next one, where's it gonna go? Look back in your notes. What's the next one that fills according to the arrows? 2s, and how many are going there? 1. 2s1. So that's where the three electrons of lithium live. Two of them live on the first floor in a nice S-shaped room, one spinning clockwise, one spinning counterclockwise. And the third one hopped on up to the, third, to the second floor and is in the S-shaped room all by himself. Can you understand that? Okay, so let's try nitrogen. We're going to go big here. What's nitrogen? What number is it? Seven. Seven. So where did the first two go? One S. The first two go into the one S. The next two are going to go into the two S. And then if you look at that little chart, the next rooms that start filling up are the P rooms. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the P's, there are three P rooms, X, Y, and Z. One of these electrons is in X, one is in Y, and one is in the Z orientation P rooms. Yes, Hunter? How do they spin? Uh, they would all go clockwise. Okay, so what's the difference between S and sphere? S is sphere. P looks, they say it's dumbbell, but it looks like a balloon twisted in half. <laughs> Sam is not loving this new knowledge. Yes. How many electrons does each one hold? Each one can hold two. There are three P orbitals, and each one of them got one. It all it'll make more sense once we play our game. Just hang in there. You'll be all right. All right. Notice it says we will do an activity. That's our game, and we will get better at this. Not today. We're going to probably save that till Monday. All right, so our next important thing is light. Remember in our video, whoop, whoop, where the electrons would jump off and give the extra energy off as light? Okay, this is called light emissions or bright line emission spectrum. And what it is, if you excite electrons with heat or electricity or a bunch of other ways that we're going to do it in lab, they will jump up. They will jump up to another orbital and give off the extra energy as light. So this is one of the most fun labs we do. Now, if you are colorblind, I do give you extra points on this test because there are going to be test questions that are specifically about color. And um, most of you have already let me had your parents let me know if you're colorblind. If not, make sure your parents let me know that you're colorblind. All right. So I've had my colorblind kids get frustrated here, and I've also had kids discover they're colorblind in this section too. Uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that later. All right, because each atom has a unique orbital patterns, each atom has a different number of protons, so if it's a neutral atom, each atom has a different unique number of electrons, right? You followed that sentence? Okay. Because each atom has a unique orbital pattern, they give off unique light. Bands of light, like a broken rainbow. So what it looks like is this. Do you see this little broken rainbow? Uh, it's, and notice that it's still in the order of Roy G. Biff. 
the order of the rainbow. But it's just little slivers of light that represent the orbitals that the electrons are jumping out of. And we saw that in our video. <laughs> I told you I'm gonna talk about that video for the rest of the semester. You might need to rewatch it. It's on Canvas if you need to watch it again. But he talked about this in our video, about how the electrons jump off at different points because they're different, they have different orbitals. And this gives each of them a different, unique light pattern. So it is called the electron fingerprint. Just like how you're the only one with your fingerprint. They say even identical twins don't have exactly the same fingerprint because they'll have like little scars and stuff because they've lived different lives. But, but twins almost have the same fingerprint. But it's an atomic fingerprint. This little pattern of light, if you know how to read it, you can look at this and know which element is giving off this light. And we're going to talk about that in the exciting sequel to our video, Adam's Ring of Truth, Doubt. You know, the sequel always uh, introduces new conflict, right? We, we, we've seen episode five of Star Wars. Okay. All right. Any questions about that idea? We're going to do a lab with that to help you understand it. All right. Next idea. A few little things here to finish up. One is, and we've talked about this a lot, but I just want to make sure you know these terms, chemical versus physical property. What we have been studying a lot are physical properties. We studied density in our lab yesterday. That was yesterday, right? We did the pennies. No, it was the day before. Uh, we looked at the physical property of um, appearance of the pennies. And then one of your questions on your lab was, how can we know which what metal we made. And I heard some of you say the right answer, that it was density. We've learned that physical property of density. Well, there is also something called chemical properties, and it's how it reacts or how it changes when it reacts with another element. So after this unit, we're going to go into bonding and chemical reactions but right now, I just wanted to make sure you understood what we've been studying so far are physical properties. And the, this light that is going to be given off is a physical property of these elements. If it's a physical property, it's all by itself. It's not how it reacts with something else. So we, we are looking at more physical properties before we move on. So physical properties are properties you observe without changing do y'all remember the abbreviation for change? What is it? Well, you'll know it. Triangle, triangle Greek letter, letter delta. Sometimes you'll see triangle I-N-G. We can make it a gerund. Changing, okay? Uh, and for example, emission spectra are physical properties. P-H-Y-S-I. Okay, so sometimes they will show you the rainbow with the, with the lines from the specific element blacked out. And then sometimes you'll see the rest of the rainbow blacked out and the rainbow, broken rainbow lines there instead. There is a test question on what are the order of the broken rainbow lines, and it's Roy G. Biff. Y'all need me to sing the song? Roy G. Biff is a colorful man, and the rainbow's in. All right. States of matter. Uh, another physical property is state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma, lowest energy, highest energy. We'll learn more about this in our thermochemistry unit. What is plasma though? Tell me where you find plasma. Space, yes. Where do we find it in this room? Yes, in the fluorescent lights. Plasma is high energy gas. So it's in the fluorescent light, it's in the sun and other stars. So just to know what plasma is, it is not goo. It, oh, also plasma in your blood is um, it's something different. It's always confusing in science where we use the same word in science to mean two different things. In your blood, plasma is a liquid. It's the straw colored fluid that is left if you spin all the red cells and the platelets and stuff down in a centrifuge. Some of you health people know that. All right, now this next part of notes, we're gonna be able to skip a lot of it because we've already talked about it. Whoop, whoop, whoop. All right. We're, we
we have already done this problem of how to do average atomic mass. So we can do that. To find our other notes. Oh, there it was. All right. So let's just go over this very quickly. So why are fireworks different colors? It was in our video. Why are they? Different lights, different electrons, different atomic structure, different ways of jumping out, different broken rainbow. Okay. So how we'll say it is atomic structure. Oh, we got to hit draw. Draw. Different atomic structures. And in particular, the electrons are what jumping out is what makes the different um, rainbows. And so we're going to talk about a little bit about the, how the periodic table is organized. It's organized by, we know it's organized by number, but it's also organized by properties. And you know that because we label different parts of the periodic table and we said these were all this kind of metal and these were all this kind of gas remember that so we know it has also reflected with the properties now when i was telling you how to do the 1s2 and 2s2 and then comes 2p6 and doing the letters the going through the arrows um i said that there's going to be an easier way to do it it's based on the periodic table instead of having to draw those lines, and it's because the periodic table is based on properties. So the reason why the periodic table has the shape it does that's a little weird is because of the way the orbitals are filled. Dun -dun -dun, new knowledge. Okay, so the history of this, in 1913, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr discovered electrons and atoms can only be in certain energy levels. That's our Bohr model. And it's like a ladder. So we have a ladder there, and it has to jump between the rungs. The low energy is at the bottom, so like that 1S room is the low one, easy to get into. The high energy is at the top. So if you had a 7S room, it would take a lot of energy for that poor little electron to jump in there. When they jump, what's it called? Quantum leap. Quantum leap. Quantum leap as they go up. The amount of energy to go up a level is called a quantum. The reason why they can give off light is electrons have a dual nature. Let me make myself a note to show you something. Because I thought of it yesterday, I was going to show you today, and I forgot, so I better make a note. I'll remember to share this to you on Monday. Otherwise, I might forget. Okay. So they have a dual nature. They can both be described as a wave. Oh, I'm writing it on the wrong side. Write it the other way, or a particle. All right, so those are my particles, and there's the wave. Do you have the wave and the particle on yours? Yes. Okay. So they can be a wave or a particle. So they can be a little, a, like a little ball, or they can fly, they can, uh, fly off as light. There's a relationship between light and electrons. And you know that. Because if you want to turn on the light in your room, what do you do? Turn on the electricity, right? And what is electricity but flowing electrons? So you already know there is a relationship between light and electrons. So here are the electrons. They're little particles moving through the wire, and they hit the filament of your incandescent light bulb, and they hit a lot of resistance, and they say, Shazam! I know they do. And they can go flying off as a photon of light. Yes. What? Sparks, yeah, sparks, uh, are, they are part of the energy of the light being given off, the extra electrons. And we're going to do that. We're going to be talking more about this in the light lab we're going to do next week. 
All right, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so as a particle, it can push a paddle wheel. So that's how they figured out that electrons could be like a particle, is it can push a, like a little, um, just a little, like when you blow on that thing and it turns around, you can do that with electrons. You can make it turn around, okay? Um, so, and then they can also be given off as light. Now, the lowest possible energy level has a special name. What's it called? All right, this was our other notes. What's the lowest energy level called? It's the only one with an extra name. Starts with a G. Ground state. You'll learn it. The lowest the energy level is called the ground state. When they jump up, they're said to be, yay, excited. They're in an excited state. They jump up to be in an excited state, okay? Um, when they go back down, they can give off the extra energy as light. Each atom releases a different bat pattern of light called a bright line emission spectrum. We already learned that in the other notes. It is like a fingerprint. We already learned that in the other notes. A fingerprint for the atom. All right, that was good. Page two of the extra notes. All right, now, uh, yes. Talk to Sophia Bird. She's not here today. All right, thank you. Um, you get it, you can get the rainbow by passing light through a prism. Have y'all ever done that? In physical science or in elementary school, did you ever make a rainbow with a little glass triangle? That's pretty fun. Prisms separate white light into the rainbow. Roy G. Biv. And it's like a broken rainbow, little lines of color. Each color represents light energy. Remember, Big E is energy. Released by an electron when it returns from a high energy state to a lower one. So, visible light is just one tiny sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's all light. And the spectrum we learned, Ronald McDonald, is very ugly, extra gross. You can fill in yourself, because we've already been over that, right? Or we can say it as I'm scrolling up. What's Ronald? Radio. What's McDonald? Microwave, what is? Infrared. Infrared, which is heat. What's very? Visible. What's ugly? Ultraviolet. What's extra? X-rays. What's gross? Gamma rays, turning Bruce Banner, Banner into the Hulk. I watched that What If last night. Interesting, the one about zombies. Okay, all... All of these travel at the speed of light. So there's a test question that tries to trip you up. How fast do radio waves go? The speed of light or the speed of sound? Speed of light. Speed of light. They're all emitted by the sun and other stars. All of them are waves. And they differ in wavelength. The symbol for wavelength is an upside down Y. It's another Greek letter, lambda, lowercase l. And frequency, which is written kind of curvy, either in cursive, if I can write a cursive, or like that. So if you look at the rainbow, red has, let me see here, it has a low frequency and a large wavelength. Blue has a high frequency and a smaller wavelength. What is the difference in different wavelength? What is that? Uh, and frequency. No, no. It's, that's a cursive F. No, before that. Lambda. It's an upside down Y. Greek letter, lambda. See, don't you feel smart? Learning Greek letters, being smart. All right, let's go on, see if we can get through this one. So electrons are waves because they're very small and have wavelengths. The electron microscope works because of this. Okay, quantum theory. 
Can I roll? It's a model of the atom based on something, a math called quantum mechanics. It tells us the probability Let me write fast. Of an uh, electron being found in a certain area or cloud. Where an electron is 90% of the time. These regions are called orbitals. You can't know an electron's position and velocity, which is like speed plus direction. And that's called the Heinz, both at the same time. That's the Heinzberg uncertainty principle. So on the test, there's a question, what did Heinzberg say? And the right answer is, I don't know. So sink that in. That's the test question. Okay. So quantum numbers, hashtag was numbers before it was hashtag, um, are used to differentiate between electrons. It's like an address. Each one has how many? Four. Does somebody say it? Four quantum numbers. The first one has a special name called the... Starts with a P. We have one. Principle. Yes, principle. It's spelled different, but it's the same word. The principle... I left out something. P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E. Principle quantum number. It tells the level that the electron lives on, it goes from which numbers? One to seven. See, look how much you know already. It also is represented by the letter N for number, because it's principal, it got an N. The second one tells the shape, yes. The shape is represented by the letter No. L N cursive. L in cursive. There are four choices. They are, if it's a, uh, what are the four choices? S. S for sphere, P for dumbbell, D. D for the fat pluses, and F for fuzzy. Fuzzy. Y'all are doing so good. Okay, let's look at them a little more with better drawings. So what's that one? S for Sphere. It says, what a good sphere, Andrew. The second one is P. It's supposed to look like what? What do they say that is like? Dumbbell. Dumbbell. I don't know why, but you will see this on test. What does P look like? And the right answer is dumbbell. Is that how you spell dumbbell? I put two B's in it. Okay, so this one is on the X, the Y, and the Z. D looks like a fat plus sign. This is going to be on the test. Uh, you will have to match the pictures to which ones they are. Or I don't know if we're going to say like it was a fat plus sign. Fat plus sign. You might. Who knows? All right. So here are our orientations, X, Y, and here, there's the double baby pacifier thing. The last one is F for fuzzy. fuzzy. I'm sure that's why they named it that, because that's what they look like. Fuzzies, okay? And there it is. All right, let's see. Let's look at the last thing about the numbers here. There's seven of them. See, it's times seven. The third quantum number tells which orbital of the shape on the level the electron is in. So if there's S, there's only one, so it's a zero. So the third quantum number, if it's in an S-shaped room, is always zero. For P, there are three. There's X, Y, and Z, right? So the number that tells you which one it is is negative one, zero, or one, X, Y, or Z. This is the honors only knowledge. How did you take it? Let me say it one more time. 
The numbers for the third one, if it's a P, is choices X, Y, or Z. If they were smart, they would have called them X, Y, or Z. Oh, no. They are called negative 1, 0, or 1. Okay? The, for D, there are five choices. So notice, you always start at 0. You go negative and positive until you get the right number of these. So it's negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And college chemistry kids have a very hard time with this idea. So y'all learn it now, and you can explain it to your college buddies, okay? For F, how many choices are there? Seven. seven. So we have to start at zero and make seven. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. That's seven choices. Do you see it? Okay. For the fourth quantum number, it tells which way the electron Spins. Ooh, I better not do that too much. Tells which way it spins. And what is the number either? Plus one half or minus one half. So no electrons have the same address. Our set of four quantum numbers. Then here are the rules. Each orbital can have how many electrons? Two. Two. Just roll up. Is it, is it at least two? At least two. They either have zero, one, or two. Good, good point, Hunter. They can hold two, no more. They fill the lowest energy level first. They each get their own orbital before they have to share. Before doubling up, that's Hun's rule. When they do double up, they must have opposite spins. You use the atomic number off the periodic table to know how many electrons it has. Orbital diagrams and electron configurations are models for electron arrangement. And we're going to learn how to do both of these, orbital diagrams and electron configurations. Okay, yay, we have more than 15 minutes. So we have enough time to get the data for our lab, and y'all can finish the lab at home. So I need you to quickly go sit with your lab partners taking all of your stuff. On your way, each person needs one of these. So come by and pick up a lab sheet on your way, and I'll get your materials ready. Go sit with your lab partners. Get a, a lab sheet off of my desk, and I'll get your lab materials ready. Is anybody missing your lab partner today? Oh, Somebody's missing your lab partner? So I'm going to have less than 13 groups? If somebody's missing your lab partner, go work with another group. Is anybody working with another group? Did you see your biscuit in the refrigerator? Mm -hmm. I could lie and say it was mine. Well, you could be, man. Because I, I forgot my breakfast. Uh, for the question for the lab, for the pennies, can we give those weird bonus little buckets? Can you paragraph here? It would be good if you do. Or just those five portions. Just the five. That, that bonus, those extra ones might help you with your, um, with your, um, conclusion. Yeah, but wait, I got even enough. I don't want to too many because I'm stingy. Yes, that's the data sheet. One per person. Why? Oh, one per person. It's going to go in your packet. Yes. Here.
Unstable. Okay, so these are radioactive isotopes. We use M&Ms because they're safer. Now, number one, are you required to eat your lab material? Yes. No. No. So if you're a vegan and can't eat this or allergic to red dye number five or kosher or halil or something else, you are not or on a sugar-free diet, you are not required to eat your lab material. So don't give me any grief about it. You can tell I've been doing this for years, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you start with the spiel about don't give me grief about not being able to eat your M&Ms. You don't have to eat them. Okay, you can give them away. You can give them back to me. Uh, you should wash your hands first, but not yet, and get a towel. What you're going to do, so your hands are clean handling them, so then if you eat them, they're not dirty, right? What you're going to do is you're going to cover your M&Ms, and you're going to shake them and pour them out on your towel carefully. You're not going to dump them and make the M&Ms roll all over the room. All the one, but first you have to count them. You, you, first, the very first time you count them, you write down how many you have. That is trial zero. Look at your data table. Everybody see trial zero? The number of undecayed for trial zero is however many M&Ms are in here. Probably less than 100. Probably maybe somewhere around 60 to 80 is what I gave you. Count them and write it down. Then you shake it. Pour them out, and all of the ones that have the M side up have decayed. You count them and write down that number for decayed. You subtract it from your original, that's your undecayed. You put all the ones that did not have an M back in the cup and shake it and do it again. You do this over and over again till all your M and M's have decayed. Does that make sense? Can you imagine that? Do they all will go away because every time one turns over to M, it gets, it gets out. Once you have all that data correct, you may eat your lab equipment. You're not required to, but you may, if you so desire, eat your lab equipment. If you don't want it, give it back to me. Okay, any questions? When you get home, you'll turn the page over and make your graph and answer the questions. Everybody understand? Yeah. All right, come get your cup of M&M's. One per group. <laughs> you have plenty of time. Don't worry, I'm good at this game. Also, the time is 10 seconds for you to shake it. Shake your cup and it's 10 seconds. Have a cup. Have a cup. Oh, M&M's. How are you today, Lady? You good today? Better now, I gave you a minute. Who else needs M&M's? Wash your hands and get a towel to pour your M&M's out on. Wash your hands, get a towel to pour your M&M's on. Oh, I did one group not get their M&M's. I got one cup left. Any groups not get your cup of M&M's? Because I know you're 
should eat that one because it doesn't, it's not a good amount. Oops. 